Today is March 11th, 2021. Did I start too soon? Nope, we're in recording. Um, and this is the school committee um, finance subcommittee. Um, we're going to start by um, with the first item on the agenda, which let me just pull it up and make sure I get it all right. Um, so that's acceptance or approval of the minutes from our last meeting, which is February 18th. Um, so we'll start with that. Do I have a motion to approve? Thank you, David. Do I have a second? Thank you, Susan. Okay, Susan, how do you vote? Yes, David? Yes. yes. Dimitri? You're on mute. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I vote yes. Uh, second item on the agenda, acceptance of gifts and grants. Uh, do we have a motion? Thank you, Susan. Second. Dimitri, David. Thank you, David. Okay, Dimitri. Yes. David. Yes. Susan. Yes. Okay. And then third thing, establishment of a K-8 athletics revolving fund. Do we have a motion? Mariah, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do we have discussion on, on the subject after the motion has been seconded? Yep, I was gonna do that. Okay, so yes, I'll second the motion then. I need a first first. <laughs> I need a motion and then a second. Okay. Um, I'm gonna move it. You're gonna second it, right? Okay. Okay, okay. Right. now we have discussion. Go for it, Dimitri. <laughs> I think I needed to understand a little bit more what what goes into creating that revolving fund and sort of, you know, it was not clear to me, so. Okay, Mary Ellen. Um, we're creating this revolving fund because the the um, K through eight extramurals and sometimes uh, extramurals program um, has been commingled with the high school athletics. And we need to separate out those fees um, because uh, K eight extramurals and or, and we also have things like um, at Heath, we have Frisbee and we have some other K through eight sports that are being run through student activities and they really shouldn't be run through student activities. They really should be run through a revolving fund mm -hmm. and they shouldn't be commingled with the high school because we don't have a K-12 athletic program. We have a 9-12 and a K-8 athletic program. Okay. So it's really about segregation of funds. Funds, okay. Any other questions or anything else, Mary Ellen, you think people should know? Um, this is also tied to uh, the return of intramurals um, and extramurals as part of, because there are operating budgets that fund um, the extramural portion. So these are these two are together and will show up on a separate budget page um, with a budget and the revolving fund and what the expenses are. Um, there are a couple other items sort of also hanging out in transportation as well that need to be moved out of the transportation budget into a specific um a different account structure so okay um so are we ready for a vote okay susan david yes dimitri yes and i vote yes okay i think that that's gotten us through um, all of the things we needed to manage. So now we're gonna go into the main event, um, which is the non-personnel expenses um, portion of the budget review. Um, Mary Ellen, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay. And I notice we're missing a couple people still. Do we expect- Oh, so, um, so Fung and uh, Scott Moore, Fung Yang and Scott Moore had other commitments this evening, so I've prepped with them. Okay, and what about Casey? I don't know, it, did I, Casey just got off of the negotiations link, so I'm not sure where she is. Okay. Is she, and I'm assuming Robin sent her a link from earlier today. Does anyone have Casey's number Well, that we can give her a quick call? Um, I do, if you wanna. Well, you're gonna present, I don't wanna, I can, call her. I can call her. Okay. okay. Well, everyone can call yeah, her. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be great. Okay, go ahead, Mary Ellen. Sorry, who's right. doing it? You are, oh, Andy. All right. 
or Maddie. You asked who, it's going to be you. <laughs> it's gonna, her phone's going to blow up with all these people calling her all of a sudden. Okay, um, I'm going to share my um, screen here. Um, so we are, um, so the purpose of this presentation is to, to really sort of show what the um, expense budget request is and the details of that. And we have some additional department heads here to help with any answering any questions um, with regards to any of these funds, any of these accounts uh, going forward. So um, our expense budget uh, it is made up of contracted services, supplies and materials. Um, what's termed as other, I'll call that it's a catch-all, it's uh, and utilities and equipment, also known as capital. Okay, um, so just we're going to put this slide in for most of our presentation, general presentations is really about education and information uh, with regards to our budget planning. So our um, expense budget that we're looking at um, is roughly um, around $19 million as a rec standing request at this point. Um, and it includes a number of different things that we pay for as part of our our budget. So we're going to go through what each one is, each uh, item is, and then what the increases are and where those increases are going to show up in those line items. Um, so we have different um, terms. And so we sometimes people refer to things as a 52 account. That's because the account number starts with 52 in our contracted services, um, supplies, materials, just to sort of give you a grid of what those look like. So with contracted services, what is it? It requires a contract. Um, it's essentially an outside provider. Um, they're generally for services we don't provide within our district or uh, either by our employees, um, or we need additional services and support from uh, for our employees. And I'm gonna go through a number of these pretty quickly, the definitions. Um, I did not take the 60 seconds to share the slides with you ahead of time. I will do that um, is right after the meeting. Um, this, um, so for example, like our transportation provider is a contracted service. Um, Eastern Bus is um, a contracted service for us. Um, Brookline Community Mental Health, our landmark school. Um, we have proportionate share services that sometimes become contracted services, our attorneys. Um, Can you explain what proportionate share services are? So just, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so proportionate share is a requirement under the federal grants in Title I, where we need to share our um, our title, our entitlement grant money with the private schools for uh, special ed students. And so sometimes those show up as um, contracted services. Um, translation services has been a growing expense in the um, district. We Even though we do sometimes use our in, um, well, we pay our in internal employees, but we also contract out. Um, so one of the, so, so I just wanted to pull an account out, for example. So one of the ones that has had the most sort of conversation around it has been uh, the general consulting line of, um, which shows up as a budgeted amount of 688,400. And to date we've spent um, $237,000. And these are just some examples I pulled of vendors paid great over $10,000 um, in a year. Um, and so these two accounts in particular, the reason why you see the gap is because we have, we've had budget freezes every year since FY18. So roughly a million three has been removed every year out of the um, expense category, so contracted services, um, all of the categories in total. So uh, the gap that you're seeing in terms of budgeted to expended is um, pretty, is because of the fact that we've had budget freezes every year for the last four years to balance our budget. Um, so year to date expending in 2021 is um, set at really at 237 because uh, we froze the budget in November. In FY20, we froze the budget in January. Um, so we may still get to the 297 um, before the end of the year, um, or sorry, 270, 279 before the end of the year, um, because the two, I was having a problem with Munis earlier and the number may not reflect all the encumbrances accurately. Um, so 
the services budget, um, this is just a history we had put in um, and shared last year. Uh, we started with sort of a 10 year, five, ten, five year increments and then um, have, I've just shown the last four year as well as the last four years. So in 21, we had a, we had a decrease um, oops, sorry, because of the, um, because we were balancing the budget. Um, 2016, there, I'm not sure why there was a decrease. Um, that budget was set when I arrived. Um, and this year we have a significant increase and kind of want it, we've gone through the 2.7 million in prior presentations. Um, but this are, is kind of what this whole looks, what this looks like. So out of district um, tuition is um, roughly um, moving from $6.3 million to $7.1 million for an increase of 825,000. Circuit breaker- How many students do we have now? Um, I, have a, I have a slide. Okay. Oh, okay, so sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about spe um, tuition specifically of a table. The next Mary slide Ellen, is actually Mary Ellen, will you that. do me a favor too? Will you slow down just a little bit? You're going pretty fast and it's <laughs> it's such, it's a huge amount of information. I wanna make sure, sure. people can follow okay. along. I'm not quite sure how long this whole thing is gonna take. So I wanna No, I, sure. well, we've got a long time though. We've got an hour okay. and 40 minutes, so. All right, yeah. and um, so um, I'll have, I'll cover the tuitions in the next slide, which has the student numbers and the growth and where. So. Um, the, um, with that is the 300,000 that will increase for transportation because we do have an increase of students for special ed out of district tuitions. Uh, the 90,000 will show up in this general consulting line. Um, and if we continue to level fund it, um, we'll show up in that general consulting line as a category. Um, computer software, um, will also um, increase 360,000. And a lot of this is due to the funding we used for town cares um, and the SR2 money to fund an expansion in the number in the licenses for um, educational software um, and tools that students use. Um, 300,000 for the um, assessment um, tools uh, for learning, assessing learning gains. Um, would go into this um, software licenses account here. Um, and then when the school committee voted for the 125 million, we have this 867 that's unallocated and that's where this sits until we allocate it. And then any other, I just chose the largest accounts um, and that were over a hundred thousand and then the other smaller um, object codes make up 439,000. Um, the detail on those other object codes will be available on OpenGov when we get OpenGov launched. You'll be able to actually see um, all those different accounts and um, history back to 19 of, um, I believe, actual expenditures um, back to 19 for, for some perspective, historical perspective. Can you go back one second, Mary Ellen? Just, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure people realize the second column is mislabeled. It should say FY22 oh, budget. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I just want to make sure everyone's clear because that could be confusing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with the tuition budget, um, in last year's town meeting uh, budget book, we presented a tuition budget of 6,300,000 uh, with a circuit breaker offset of 1,971,000. Um, that budget was based on 67 students. Uh, this year, the tuition budget is based on 79 students, and you see where the changes are. Uh, Circuit Breaker will offset the um, tuition budget by 2.2 million, and the operating budget, so the net to the taxpayers or the operating budget will be 4.8 million, um, and roughly a net of 504. So the way we budget for tuitions is we put the whole amount in because we're using the circuit breaker as an offset. Um, so we don't net that out um, when we're showing the um, circuit breaker funding. Um, so there are 12 students um, that are increasing from 21 to 22. And I know Casey's here, if, she, if there are questions, specific questions about that, um, the number of students. Does anyone have questions about special education or where that connects to the services budget? So can can we toggle back just to the previous slide? So for example, the FY22 projection. So you have, no, this one says out of district tuition 
um, is that totaling yes, like totally. collaboratives plus? Yes, all, okay, so you put all three of them I, into one. I put four into one. Okay, so, so the two, seven, two, one, four, four, seven, two, seven. And do you mind just going back to that next slide? Uh, that's the previous slide. I meant the next one, the one about special education. So that's the seven, one, four, four, seven, two, seven right there. Okay. And then you count the circuit breaker offset that's there as a revenue as opposed to a direct offset of the that those accounts. Correct. Okay. And just to how do how do we like how does the tuition, maybe Casey can come in or you, how does the tuition what determines tuition going up or down? in these programs <laughs> for a general education moment of like, what do we control? How much do we, can we control this budget? Yeah, that's a great question. I know that um, Mike D'Onofrio was trying to sign on, but essentially we budget for, I believe it's a two and a half percent increase in tuitions every year. Um, what I reported to the committee, I believe it was probably about a year ago is what we're seeing is a lot of, the um, out of district schools are applying for what's called the reconstruction. So they reconfigured their programming and then they appeal to the state to increase their um, tuition costs because their program is now reimagined as something else. Um, and so what we've seen is anywhere between a 20 and 30% increase in tuition costs when programs are restructuring. Um, so what um, my finance manager, Mike D'Onofrio will do is um, often check the DESE site to see what programs are proposing to go through reconstruction. Um, so I guess to, that's a long way to answer is that we'd budget about a two and a half percent increase. And then how do you know, like, why do you think you have, or why do you have 61 students this year and what tells you you're gonna have 10 next year? Uh, you mean the, from 67 to 70, how do we know we have 79 students? Right, or how, right, from 67 to 79. So these are absolute numbers. Um, so it could increase next year. So of the 12, half of them are, um, I would say about half are students um, who in a pre non-pandemic year would have probably needed an out of district placement. Um, and then about the other half um, are students um, who really deteriorated um, as a result of the pandemic. So these are students you've already identified correct? and, they, and they're planning for their placement. It's not like you're, they're future students you're holding slots for. Right, yeah. And it's the uh, tuition total that we, that we um, project. Um, are there more slides and services beyond tuition, Mary Ellen, or is it, or should we go back to the services overview? Can I say something, Mariah? Yeah. Just to give some context for this, because 12 students might seem a lot, like a lot, but it's, I think if you look at where we started at 67, for our size district, it's a fairly small number. Uh, if you look at some of the other districts, uh, we and the reason it is that way is because we've done such a good job of keeping kids in, in district, uh, providing programs for providing services, um, and I think, you know, it's a tribute to Casey and her team uh, and all the special ed uh, uh, providers. In terms of the reorganization that they do, the, the private schools, they, they basically say, you know, this is why we need it. And uh, the department, DESE approves it. And once they approve it, it could be in the middle of the year. So we could get hit with some increases in the middle of the year, which is really, We've tried um, legislatively actually to talk with our legislators about, you know, making it start in September. Okay, you increase it, fine, mm -hmm. but increase it in September and not in the middle of the year when our budgets are all uh, put together. So I just wanted to give some context on the numbers and and 70, uh, I think it was 70, I, I didn't see 79. the exact, 79 is, is not a, I mean, we've been higher with less kids um, at times. Uh, so this is, you know, probably a appropriate number during a uh, pandemic. You, 
You'll also see um, in, a few, in a later slide that we'll cover is $475,000 in a special education reserve that we do um, for this purpose for contracted services and tuitions for truly unknowns and students that move in in September with, that are coming from out of state or from um, places where we have to um, take on their um, supports. And so that you'll see that in a later slide um, and that's where that sits. It doesn't, it's not quite well, it should actually be in contracted services because that's generally what those funds are used for and that account coding is not correct. Um, but I wanna just remind the committee that there, there are two reserves. One is a personnel reserve of 400,000 uh, for special education um, teachers, staff, unknowns, and 475,000 for tuition and con consulting services that are unknown and unanticipated. So that exists. Can, can you go back to the previous slide? The one, yeah, this one. Um, can we talk through um, transportation um, as well? about the increase? Um, so Matt can provide some uh, perspective around transportation, but generally when you have an increase in the number of students, um, transportation, um, he can correct me, it can run anywhere between 15 and $25,000 per student for transporting students to and from school. Matt, do you wanna add anything else in addition to transportation? No, tuition and transportation is just like salary and benefits. You generally don't have one increase or decrease without the other. You know, when tuition goes up, transportation generally goes up. Most of our out of district placements, they're singletons, maybe two kids or occasionally three kids in a vehicle, but it's not like an in-town vehicle where, you know, the vehicle, you know, gets, gets close to being filled. And the nature of it is that the kids are going to different schools because they have unique needs. Um, is that I could I could I could look up the range. Um, I'll, but I'll essentially, it's we're going from sixty-seven kids to seventy-nine kids, and so there's an increase, and so there's a sort of commensurate increase on on this. Yeah, I mean, we could pay anywhere from uh, two hundred fifty bucks a day to four hundred bucks a day, depending on the distance of the ride and the type of vehicle. And, you, and also students changing placement as they age in or have additional placements or change in placements also impacts transportation as well. So the 2623 is the actual sort of contracted amount and then the 2923 is the estimate. Like where did the 300,000 come from? Because it's clear from the, from the slide you had about why you increased the 825. But like how do you calculate 300 for the transportation amount? Or how do you estimate it? So, so we, claim, yeah, it, go ahead. it's it's a number of days times the 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 price for the vehicle. So, if um, the contract is is out to bid for next year, so we used like a three percent increase. But if somebody was going from two hundred fifty dollars a day, we'd estimate a three percent increase for that same trip next year, knowing where the kids are going for tuitions this year. And there is some uh, collaboration between the Evan, the transportation coordinator and Mike D'Onofrio at, at um, in Casey's office about tuitions to make sure that he's planning for rides where they have tuitions where they know they're going and where they think kids are gonna continue to stay. So that's how we build our list. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on transportation? David. It's not on transportation exactly, but I'm wondering if Mary Ellen could point out the line item or where compensatory services and special education would fall? Um, that would either fall within uh, general consulting services or it will be another, maybe in one of the other accounts, but it's, um, go back a slide. Um, the general consulting services, so Landmark School would potentially be providing um, consulting services as a large, um, I can go through these, Bay State Interpreters is our translation. Um, Suffolk University was um, our work around equity that we did last year. Frontline is our, um, our attendance software. Um, and 
um, most of the other, you know, consulting services are less than um, $10,000. They're short, sort of tend to be some shorter dollars. Um, there is, uh, let me go back to this slide. The other place that it will show up is under medical and hospital services um, is where compensatory services may show up as well. Um, but yeah. it's not just one account. If I can add to sure. is, um, much of the compensatory services for this year are coming from a grant. Um, it's coming from ESSERS One. Um, so we use that to pay staff to provide extra hours of services to students in addition to what Mary Ellen listed also. Um, so we don't have a specific line for compensatory services. So there come, it, it really depends on each student's plan and what service each student would get as compensation. Um, so it's hard to pinpoint, um, but the, 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 those are some examples of where the, the money would come from, the lines. Can I follow up on David's question? Mm -hmm. um, the, I guess I would add on to that, that um, are you budgeting for additional compensatory services next year for FY22? And if so, where is that request? Yeah, so um, I know that Mike has been um, preserving our reserve funding for that for next year. Which reserve funding? The, uh, the 475. So is the 475 for out of district placements or for compensatory oh, services? It's for both. Um, so it can be for students who need paras in the middle of the school year. Um, out of district, uh, tuition unexpected, um, compensatory services as well. Is it is it reasonable to assume that a level funded compensatory services budget is appropriate? Can you say that in non-finance terms? What is it reasonable to think that we should leave the budget the same next year as what it is this year, given what we know about people's need for additional services. Yeah. Are you essentially cutting off the compensatory services program at the knees by not funding it with a budget that would meet what, knowing you don't know what you need, but you could make an estimate. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make yeah, sense, the question? It does. Yeah, so we're relying on grant funding for much of it this year. We're looking for our reserve, to use our reserve funding. Um, should we need to continue compensatory for next year? So. I guess, I mean, it would be great if we could have some more cushion there going into next year, because I suspect that we will have more students um, going out of district. We'll, we'll have, we'll add to that out of district number next year. Um, Meaning, so the 475 might get taken by additional out of district placements, which then wouldn't leave any money for in district compensatory or may not leave as much money for in district. Correct, or we have new students who move in and they each have a one-to-one -one para. Right. Um, you know, within the last week, we had two students move in from Boston from specialized programs um, in Boston and they each on their IEPs have a one-to-one -one para. So is it reasonable to where, I mean, that line, that account as Mary Ellen pointed out is actually an other right now, but should we talk about, because of just the vagaries of the accounting system, but but is it reasonable to say that perhaps there should be more discussion about increasing the budget for compensatory services for FY22? I mean, I think that would be um, fantastic if there is flexibility to do that. It certainly would make it a lot easier for my team and I um, as we're thinking about compensatory for most of our students. And just Mariah, there are two there are two pots. One is the 475 that sits in expenses, and then there's 400 that sits in personnel. So it's okay. 875 total in terms of a reserve for special education. And should the personnel bit also, that would be the idea for actual compensatory services provided by our staff would be yeah. that 400? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess the question is, is that the right amount? Sorry, go ahead, Helen. How much of it has been spent this year? All of it, because we're sitting in a deficit, although I'm trying to hold back um, 
some funds. No, I mean, but how much of it has been spent on what it was budgeted to be spent, not that you're filling gaps oh. that might from that particular, I, from the budget of what you budgeted and what you're spending it on. I don't have that information. I don't know if Mike does and we can get that to the committee later. Mm -hmm. And we put a, a note on that one to get the mm -hmm. sort of detail on the compensatory services. Okay, I'm just gonna write that down. Mm -hmm. um, Then um, can we talk a little bit about the general consulting services a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Do you mind going to that slide, which you showed the, the detail slide on that? Sure. So this is another one sort of building on Helen's question of if you look at budget versus expenditure, there's quite a discrepancy. And, you know, is this somewhere where we should be thinking about reducing and reallocating that budget to other places that need it or reducing and not reallocating as we think about how, if we don't have other places that need budget. Any thoughts from the committee or Mary Ellen or it is, whoever? It is reduced already by 300,000. Well, but they're still not expending it if they're expending less than yes. 300 every year. Yes. Yeah. yes. So the I mean, there's is, a whole, go ahead, Marianne. The, the issue is that for 18, 19, 20, and 21, we've had a budget freeze. We've pulled a million three out of our entire, all the expense lines. This is one of them. Um, and so the, the question is what, how do we want to use, do we need that million three? Do we replace the million three back because nobody's had an opportunity to use their full budgets? Um, I know Mariah has been doing some um, work with uh, Gabe and the curriculum coordinators around developing a per pupil amount. So does it make sense to really take our expense budget and reallocate it and take this million, like reallocate it based on a per pupil amount um, um, and then say, okay, folks, we're level funding the supplies and materials and contracted services that all kind of make up this expense line. Um, reallocating it and you, we won't have a budget freeze this year, but next year, but that's all you have. Um, and get, getting the money into the right buckets and the right places. So that's something to consider and think about rather than level funding the budget um, and or bringing the amounts that have been reduced. We've also reduced accounts over the years as well to balance the budget. Um, so I, there's some options here. Helen? So, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm a bit confused. I understand every single one of the items that are on fiscal year 20, but that adds up to, I guess, the 279. I didn't do the math quickly. Not quite. What was, huh? Not, not quite. I didn't put, I didn't have time to put in the gap. Uh, okay. What was the full 922? I mean, that's a lot of money. What was it? What kind of consulting are we talking? I see these numbers, three of which, or two of which we're not doing this year for sure. Um, you know, 36,000. I, I don't know, you know, if the others are, and the others aren't continuing either, some of them. So what is it that we're, we're budgeting for? Um, we're level funding the budget amount um, because again, we've had freezes for- I, I heard just, it's level funded, but what is it? What what is included in the 688? I can't answer that because that history is now gone. I, I can go back to 17 no. and tell you what we, I can go back to FY17 when we didn't have a freeze and look at what we spent those funds on. Helen, I think I have a different way of approaching this is the things that we would be funding in this, in this into this account would be things like interpreter services. Mm -hmm. um, and Jim had identified, I think it goes here, the strategic planning, and that could go here. Yeah. And then the question is, are there any other things, you know, do we, do we put in something, you know, some other cushion here of like, you know, I'm just looking at FY20, for example, and I see what looks like maybe $120,000 worth of translation services. And you know we might we might put that plus a cushion in and some and 
the strategic planning and a couple other other things we identify, but we could, you know, really revisit this budget and say, what do we actually plan to fund from it, and then re, and then actually set a budget for it that is appropriate to what we envision funding from it. Does that make sense and answer some of your questions? I can also offer a tangible example if that's helpful. Sure. So um, in 2018, the state released new a new framework for social studies. And in certain grade levels, like especially seventh grade, there's a pretty significant change in what teachers should be teaching. And ideally, we would do some professional learning on those this is specifically new regions of the world that teachers haven't been asked to teach historically and are now asked to teach in the new framework because of the budget freeze we haven't been able to do that work that might be re require consulting right make right, might require subject matter experts on say the ancient history of australia and oceana and so we haven't been able to do that that's work we want to do that's work we still need to do but because of the budget freeze in order to balance the budget that might have been consulting work and then I would argue, say probably every content area has a few examples. And so while these examples that Mary Ellen has are only the ones that were individual bills of over $10,000, there are many, many bills that would have been under $10,000 across a whole bunch of departments and content areas. Thanks, Gabe. Just so in case we have participants that uh, aren't too aware of why we have a button, uh, a budget freeze and budget shortfall, we, we had to hire more staff than originally budgeted to handle Remote Learning Academy and other things related to the pandemic. That was for last year anyway, but preview, you've had budget freezes for multiple years. Same. Susan, I saw your hand up too. Oh, go ahead, Mary Ellen. Same, and then Susan. Same well, it, it was for enrollment. It was for additional staff we needed for enrollment, additional paraprofessionals, additional coaches, things like that. So, um, there, you know, we've we've been in a growth trajectory trajectory for a number of years, and so that was the other um, portion of those as our financial reports have have reported out. Susan, so I should probably know the answer to this, but as we think about the budgeting process, Gabe, to the points that you made, presumably every year we will have some number of those kinds of needs, and so. I'm trying to figure out under whether it would go on this budget or professional development, because I think a, 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 before the pandemic, we were sort of having a conversation about how professional development money was spread across so many different buckets with so many different owners. It was really, really hard to kind of have a consolidated perspective on it. And I think this was actually a piece of the conversation that we had with Nicole about what do we do? Like, how, how are we, where are we putting budget dollars? Um, so, I'm not sure if we have to do it this minute, but Mariah, at some point, is probably worth revisiting that conversation so we have a comprehensive sense of professional development. Because yeah. I, I totally believe what you're saying, Gabe, but I'm trying to figure out, like, from a budget perspective, how decisions are getting made about which bucket is getting allocated to, if that makes sense. Because we're going to have this every year. Yeah. Well, and I agree. And I think we sort of started to have that at the curriculum coordinators meeting last week, or maybe it was the week before. Um, and when Gabe was talking in my head, I was thinking, I don't know if I would put this in that bucket, although it might be where it has gone, right? Like there's, I think to me, it's a professional development and not just a general consulting services, but, but yes, yeah. it's an important conversation to have of where should it be allocated and then actually charging it there. Yeah, just very briefly, historically, things that are very specific to a content area have fallen in the content area. So again, professional learning on the ancient history of Australia is very social studies specific. So it would typically come out of the social studies budget. Whereas something like the restorative justice work is district wide and that's historically come out of the OTL central budget. Um, for FY22 in particular, basically all of the central OTL funds got uh, distributed into department budgets because we cut so much out. Mariah? Yes. I have Hi. A, um, Go one ahead. Comment and one question. I think similar. So my first question to Mary Ellen um, is a PD one as well. Like I'm thinking of the SEL needs of our students when they come back in the fall, and I was just wondering, um, are we paying for responsive classroom for the elementary K through eight schools? Will they have that, and where where should I see that? 
Um, I'm not sure about responsive classrooms. It specifically Gabe, do you know, or Casey? Cause I know you've been working with Michelle. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, Dimitri, there isn't a district wide training right now for staff on um, responsive training. So much of it is um, teacher specific. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and then um, Mariah, my, my, my comment was that I know we've talked about, I know Jim had talked about doing a strategic plan and having that in a budget. I, I'm wondering whether <laughs> in a tight year where we may possibly have to do cuts, um, are we ready for that? Or do we give the new superintendent at least one year and then that is something we budget for in the FY23? Yeah, I think that's something to talk about, right? As a as a as a group of, you know, what do we and to talk about with Jim um what makes sense there. Um I, I just want to make one other sort of big comment about budgeting as we think about finance and budgeting, is there's sort of like two schools of thought of um, you know, you can you can either sort of go from a budget, you sort of say, oh, I've got X amount and I had, I had 100,000 last year. And so I'm gonna budget another 100,000 this year. Or you can look at what you actually spent in an account and think about making your budget start at, at least start at what you spent the previous year and then, and then adjust from there. Um, and that gives you, you know, you might have a reason to, for example, add or subtract from that number based on what you're planning or what you know, but it at least gives you that baseline of actuals too. So there's there's something to be said for us, like uh, looking at this kind of a chart of what's actually being spent, the actuals versus the budget and doing some thinking where they really are, especially where they have such a divergence like this, you know, what's really going on um, and, and how should we better have our budget when you have your budget, which is a goals and a priority statement, and then what's happening in your actuals doesn't actually map with your budget, there's some there's some weird stuff going on, right? So we should be thinking about if the budget's a priority, a, a statement of priorities, how we make sure that our priorities are then enacted through the actual expenses. So that's, that's something for us to sort of be philosophical about, not necessarily in this exact moment. Um, any other comments on, on this? slide before we go back to the overall services slide? No? Okay. Do you mind taking us back, Marilyn, to that other one? I think it's the next one. That's the previous one, maybe. Or maybe it's, the, oh, there it is. Uh, one back. Um, I'm just looking at the big line items. Matt, could you talk to us about the building cleaning? Yeah, so we have a hybrid cleaning model. And by hybrid, I mean uh, our employees, uh, custodians provide some of the cleaning, and we have a cleaning vendor that comes in. Uh, we've had the model for quite some time, well before I got here. Um, and it, it works rather well for us. Uh, what does a hybrid mean? Can you talk a little bit more about what you're... So, some of the cleaning is performed by our employees and the other part of it is performed by vendor services. And we contract out for that. We, we, uh, we procure the services via the state contract who, who sort of bids it out. And then we, we, we pay at a per hour uh, rate for the cleaning vendor to come in. And the, some of the advantages to that for us are that we don't have to deal with um, downtime. If the person's going to be out because they have vacation or they've called in sick to their employer, their employer provides coverage and somebody comes in and, and, and covers that shift for us where sometimes with our employees, it can be a little more challenging to do so because then that becomes our work to find the coverage instead of theirs. Right. Um, so, and uh, practically speaking, I'm sure there'd be a few union folks that might disagree with me. Um, we divide up the work and the cleaning vendor sometimes gets some of the chores that some of the custodians or types of work that they don't enjoy doing as much as others. So it kind of works out well for our staff. Although, and when I say you might get some, I might get some disagreement, they've, they've disagreed with that and said we, we would do any and all of the work if asked, which I'm not arguing with. But, you know, when you get to divide up the work and dole things out, 
we kind of know how that's going to go. How does the dollar amount, like, so it's level funded and, and how does that dollar amount get determined and decided? Uh, Are you on a contract? Is, is it a multi-year contract? How does this work? No, it, it's, it's, it's an hourly rate and, and that amount is uh, uh, a little low. So I'm not sure if my, my budget didn't come through or not, but I mean, it I- It was, it didn't, because okay. I didn't have it before we presented in February. All right. So, um, it, so you so requested that, an increase, but it didn't make it into the numbers? Yes, okay. correct. So if you don't have an increase, well, what did you request that didn't make it in? $694,000. So it, about 148,000 more that was there. Um, you know, we're adding square footage for Tappan and for STEM. Um, so that's an, an additional nine hours of contractor cleaning time per day, plus the, the regular increase. Um, so it, it's, and I get we have a, a budget shortfall. So, the, you know, the effect would be that we just reduce cleaning time uh, and vendor help when school is not in session on school vacations and, and the summer period. Was that, was that additional, I, I'm recalling a conversation, I can't remember if we had it at Capital or Finance, when there was a whole discussion about that within the 2018 override, there was some accommodation for additional staffing related to the um, related to the new in. building. Yeah, I, I followed up with um, Melissa on that. She said it did not make it into the final override calculation and vote. It's, That's unfortunate. Yes, um, because it impacts Charlie uh, Simmons in the public building division impacted Matt. Um, and so, um, that, you know. What's the percentage of, do you know off the top of your head, Matt, or close to what the percentage of square feet, like percentage increase of square feet that the new buildings coming online in the fall are gonna represent? Uh, I didn't do that percentage, but you know, we go from 1.7 million square feet to just over 1.8 million square feet. So- uh, 6%, I don't know, I'm doing the math no, off the top of my head. I, I yeah, it's like 6%. Okay. I think. Um, okay. So, and, Mariah, and yeah. yeah, I know you're trying to drill down on this, but you have to remember those buildings aren't going to be turned over to us until January. So we're talking half a year on that extra. On, and, on, on 22 Tappan, but on the schedule for the STEM is that we should get that in August. In August. Okay. So that one, but that was square that the additional square footage there is not the huge amount of square footage there's additional uh, there's additional from what it used to be at the, at the uh, Robert's wing right um, so that's an additional 26,000 square feet for them to clean it's an additional 69,000 square feet for them to clean going from old Lincoln to 22 Tappan okay so that's maybe something for us to also to consider what we go on. Then do we have anyone who can talk about the, um, the 360? Software? Yeah, the yeah. software. Yeah, so the, um, the, like I had said before, is that the, there are two accounts for software. One is the um, 522.016, the, the 606,000, and the other one is software licenses um, at 431,000. Um, the way the town does this is the software licenses are sort of like a one-time purchase or the initial purchase, and then the recurring costs are in the computer software repair and maintenance. So I don't know why the town differentiates it that way. That's what happens. Um, so the 360 was put in, in the, rip, um, the first line because that's generally the, about the total amount. It's probably a little bit high. It's a little bit above. The total amount of what we spent through Town Cares, um, what we spent through Essers One um, for additional software for software licenses, and also within our own operating budget, uh, we had we had um, purchases that um, moved out of supplies and materials into software licenses from a variety of departments. Um, 
and um, the other, uh, so that's the 360. The 300 is um, essentially a, a funding for, to be determined, um, ass assessment tools to measure student learning growth. Um, as we, the only thing we have in the district is the BAS. Um, we do not have any other types of diagnostic and or assessment um, tools that we would be using. Um, and I know that um, Michelle Herman is working on with a group of um, coordinators around what those would look, what those might be. And there'll be some sort of report at some point about what's gonna yeah. go on there, the proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that a one-time? Not, no, not, uh, not typically in, um, as I would say in prior districts that had a variety of tools, those were every year annual. They were teacher tools that they use all the time. And sometimes they're, and Gabe can probably talk to the different types of tools that teachers use, but you know, they can be like a 15 minute, 20, 15 minute, five minute diagnostic tool to assess where a child is in math or reading or some content area. So Gabe, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I mean, just there's a huge range of options. Um... You know, the more heavy doses can be anywhere from four to six weeks, or it can be a beginning of the year, end of the year as a broad. It, so it, it really depends on instructional decisions and what's going to be kind of worthwhile. And then internally designed tools versus paying for an external design, right, would be, again, different costs and different frequencies. And kind of if we adapt up, accept someone else's model versus designing or adapting. There's a lot of options there. Okay, Jen. Sorry, and I, I apologize if I missed this, but I just noticed in the um, chat, there's a question about interpretive services for FY21. And I just wanted to see, did I miss that conversation? And if not, could we just sort of talk about that for a second? I did miss that and it, and it, is in there. Do you mind going to that slide, Mary Ellen, on the general consulting? The breakdown? Oh, I don't know if it's one of those ones. But Casey we, and Mary Ellen, we must have spent money on it because yeah, we've been we doing. Have. So a yeah. lot of the interpretive services have been um, sent to, we have been paid by Town Cares. A significant portion um, has been on Town Cares and other uh, and um, we've been holding back the operating budget funds as long as possible because um, we had a surge of notices during the um, summer uh, for translation. So a lot of that has been off um, off our operating budget. Do it's, we have it's happening. Do we have separate line items for translation and, and interpret interpretation? since they're somewhat different? Do we so have translation, lines? depending on who we're hiring, um, no, trans, um, no, there aren't separate lines. It's the same. Okay, and but do we, we do have an appropriate amount budgeted for the upcoming no. year? No, no, we don't we have. We never have, we never have. Um, we, we have not ever had enough. Uh, Mindy and I have conversations on a quarterly basis and we work, um, you know, I, she keeps me informed on where she is and I work that into my budget estimates in terms of money that needs to be held or reserved or if funds become available um, to be able to fund her the needs that she has. Would it not make more sense for us perhaps to have a separate, rather than having it embedded in, within general consulting to actually have a proper account for it? Well, there is, um, so we've been working on that this year of making sure people are charging the correct account for the type of service. Um, so I just don't have the, I, I didn't pull, I didn't pull that particular contracted service up uh, for this report. I can provide you what that account is and. Um, oh, so, but in FY21 it was listed or in FY2020 on the slide where it's the detail translation yeah. was in general consulting. So you're saying you've now Established in this. Okay, so it's now its own account already. Yep. Okay. Do you know what the budget was for that account? Then? Um, it's generally been around um, between seventy and eighty thousand dollars a year. 
or, le or less. We've been trying to get it to 80. I think we finally did that this 21. I'll get you the information. I can add it. I can. Okay. Mary Ellen, I would just be curious too, how much over we think, if we set up a certain budget, how much are we going over? Um, and why doesn't that become part of the budget? Um, for this, uh, so part of what uh, Mindy and I do with her budget requests is, and with the superintendent, we've been uh, trying to attempt to add to that. So some of it has come from um, increases with Title III funds. Um, some of it this year for 21 has come from um, town cares and the town cares funds uh, for translations. So um, there are, it, it gets to this, um, it gets to the same question we, we've been dealing with earlier, which is um, looking at each category in each account and saying, hey, do we, if you haven't spent all of your funds, did you spend it elsewhere in your budget? So do we need to realign the budget? So for a lot of years, the accounts and the balance of, of the accounts or the budget amount of the accounts didn't really reflect the, what they were spending. Um, and we've been working on trying to reallocate those accounts every year so that um, if you're taking $5,000 out of a contracted service line every year to pay for supplies, let's just increase your supply budget so you don't have to do the transfer in, you know, um, every year. Let's put the money where you actually need it and spend it. So we've been working and chipping away on that. Um, but let me just write this note for translation services. Well, the other thing that makes me think of is if you, for example, two years ago or last year, translation was embedded within general services, but then you've added a translation budget for 80,000, but translation used to be in there, then general services should have been reduced unless you were adding something else into it, right? Or am I misunderstanding something? No. Right, because at least, I, I think there's at least 100 and easily identifiable 103, almost 104,000 in there that were translation in FY20. And then it's interesting to think if it was 100,000 in FY20, but Mindy got budgeted 70 or 80 for FY21, there's also some other questions on there about the reduction from one to the other. Um, do we have more? Um, more questions on services or do we want to continue on to supplies? No, the only thing I wanted to share before we go and I've oh, yes. a slide in um, is that, you know, first of all, OpenGov will have a breakdown by department and for 52 accounts and all of the uh, org object codes that people have. So that will be showing up on OpenGov. Um, but I wanted to share, hopefully this will work for me. Um, wanted to share the town's open checkbook. So I know there are questions about specific vendors that are paid. This is not gonna work for me on my screen. Let me stop sharing and get to this page. Um, and um, it's being slow for me. So the town has uh, what's called the uh, Town of Brookline checkbook, and you can put a vendor name in this search box here. Um, and this is available through um, their website and it currently shows sort of what the history is with each vendor and um, who we've paid. Um, and I'm not sure what the sort order is. I can't help you with that. Um, but I know that we've had a lot of questions around, I'm just gonna pick on panorama and just show you how easy this is to use. Um, and um, I'm going to get the blue spin ball. There we go. And it will, unfortunately, it spins. <laughs>
there we are. So in 19, uh, 2019 was the last time we paid Panorama and we paid them $15,000. Um, and- I thought we were doing Panorama this year. Uh, I don't- We are, <laughs> and it's being paid for, Susan, by um, Trisha's um, healthcare grant that she gets. I don't know what this 15 grand is though. I think it was about eight or 12 for us to do the surveys this year. And so um, I don't know if this is all, I believe this is all funds. So we just haven't, we have not paid Panorama just yet. I believe is where, right, why that's not showing up. Like I saw Ron was paid under there and they're paid out of a building project yep. fund. So, it's all, so it all should funds, be all funds. All vendors. Um, we may not have just paid, we may not have paid Panorama just yet this year. And so, so I just want to point is out it also that true that they then they wouldn't have been paid at all in FY20 because they showed up for FY19 and you know you're paying them in FY21. We did not have Panorama in 20. I do know that we did not use them. Okay. Um, so let me get back to presenting. So just to harp on what you just did, you you provided the link to what's called Open Checkbook. So anyone who's curious about any what any vendors in the town are getting paid can go yep. there at any time without filing a FOIA to get the information. The good right. news is there's just a link they can go to whenever they want to see who's getting paid what. Right. Thanks. Yes. So just um, now we're moving on to the supplies and materials. Um, again, these are pretty much, they are consumables um, is where supplies and materials are. There could be textbooks. Um, and the like that are in here, staplers, things like that, um, biology supplies. And just for example, these are the vendors that we pay um, the most. I didn't get the budget finished on this particular line. It ran out, literally ran out of time. Um, and um, the, uh, these are typical, you know, large vendors where we purchase supplies and materials from for a lot of different things. Um, some titles are self-explanatory, some are not. Um, this is the budget that we've had for um, our supplies and materials uh, budget this year uh, and last year. Um, these are the generally the large line items that we have. So instructional supplies is clearly the largest. Um, and I did run a report I can show um, with regards to where how that line of item of a million dollars is distributed across multiple departments. Um, we have textbooks and print material, um, computer supplies, uh, which might be printer cartridges, uh, books and periodicals. That's typically the library um, is a library specific account, um, special program supplies, general supplies. Generally these are, we actually have too many of these accounts. Um, the DESI, uh, end of year report actually requires a lot fewer of reporting of these accounts. So um, there's some work that we need to do to minimize some of these. Um, and then we added in the 692,000 um, uh, cuts and reductions that were happened in, in these accounts um, over the last few years to balance the budget. Um, so the 75,000 was a specific request um, for specialized instruction materials and the 692 um, is for the return of the uh, ad backs or the reductions that were experienced. Um, let me stop sharing and see if I still have opened this report that I ran that um, shows that I can show on the screen. Um, And I will try, to, I will make it larger once I get my screen. Um, so how is, is that large enough? Can I make it larger? It's okay, I think for me, does anyone else need it larger? And I can't see the chat. So somebody's gonna have no, this to is, this with This the is chat. good so far, Mary Ellen. Okay. Yeah. Um, there we go. All right, so um, this is where the um, distribution is for uh, you know our our expense um, supply accounts are co just consolidated. Um, so you'll see there's a large portion in education technology up here. Um, 
There is the next largest is information services. Um, you have another large with math that has to do with the um, uh, implementation of the math curriculum is where those, that's why that one's very large. English language arts, uh, which is K through eight curriculum coordinator um, and the high school, what's budgeted there. So these are K-12 numbers. Um, and they're not broken down by, I can do it by building at some point. Um, and the next one is sort of elementary um, kind of, this is really the budget available to the K through eight principals. They only have 243,000 amongst themselves, amongst them um, out of the 1.7 million for um, supplies uh, and materials. Mary Ellen, the year to date means till today or? Yep. Correct. So this is what we've expended to till Through, today. Yep, when I ran the report. Uh -huh. um, and what we have encumbered and the 514 is offsetting um, our budget deficit to get us down to, well, to get our deficit to 810, which is where we're currently sitting. Uh -huh. So we don't have 500,000 to spend because we have a negative. I wasn't planning negative. on spending it. But <laughs> well, I just, for the audience to be clear is that we have a budget deficit of $810,000 and this, that deficit is depending greatly on 514 to get to 810 deficit. Otherwise, if we spent this, our deficit would ex uh, increase by 514. Mm -hmm. David. I see that some categories, uh, the percent used is over 100%. So mm -hmm. what ends up happening in those situations? So um, they are likely, they have funds that have been are available in other accounts and contracted services maybe, or in other or in equipment. Um, and so this is a, a type of report that I can generate and I would be very interested in having a future committee meeting is what reports would the finance subcommittee like to see um, so that you can actually see um, what a department is doing on their expense budget in total. Um, so you don't, and then if you want it, how do you want that broken down? Um, so uh, Gabe, I'm gonna, Mariah, if it's okay, I call on people if I see them. Yeah, go for it. I okay. want to also talk to Gabe about, we'll get to the supplies thing that Gabe worked with yeah. me on, but go ahead, Gabe, you you start yeah. and then we'll keep going. Well, I think just an example too, uh, right? Cause this is only pulling the materials section of everyone's budget. And so like social studies is actually a good example of this. I spend almost completely out of materials. Um, and so I may, as long as the bottom line of the budget is, is in the black, um, I can overspend the materials line because there might be money left in the consulting line. And so this here's a good example of that because I can't really do a lot of the consulting work because of the pandemic and because of, you know, access and time for folks to participate in that work. Um, I may have spent more in um, supplies than I would have originally intended, like I've shifted priorities. Right, so we're seeing the supplies like sort of column of people's budget, but they're but people like Gabe are looking in the horizontal and making sure that he stays all in across his entire budget. So, um, so I just want to show if it's okay, Mary Ellen, do you mind stop stop, stop sharing for one second? I want to show um, this is a little bit of a repeat of last night. Um, so, uh, for people who um, were here last night. Uh, I've been working, I'll repeat this, but I've been working with different, I'm building this budget model and, and there's a staffing side to it, but there's also a materials side to it. There'll be an everything side to it. But so far with the, um, one of the things that's become the most complete is the K-8 supplies budget. And I'm just gonna pull up on my screen, um, the amazing work that, um, that Gabe and the curriculum coordinators did um, in terms of developing budgets. Sorry, I'm trying to like get the thing to open up here. So this is um, the, uh, which one am I in? This is math and it's showing, I'm gonna make it a little bigger for people to be able to see, showing the sort of detailed um, uh, supplies that they need, materials and supplies that they need for, um, 
for kindergarten. And you can see that there's the details there of exactly what is spent, um, whether it's teacher materials, student materials, sort of multi-year material, like you can see maintenance of things that are meant to last over multiple classes, but they, they do wear out as Mary Ellen noted in the beginning, supplies eventually wear out. Um, and each one of the programs through K through eight did this for all of their grades. So it's K, first, second, At the bottom of the spreadsheet, you can see there's math, ELA, science, social studies, K-8, um, world language, performing arts, visual arts, wellness. And, um, and it, what they did at the end is it actually rolls up to this really great summary that you can see of, um, of all of the uh, costs per grade. And when I took that, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can find the other spreadsheet, make sure I've got it here. When I took those numbers, and this is again, just for K-8, um, K-8 for their curricula, just those supplies. The K-8 supplies for materials is 1.1 million. And that's not for like the building, that's just for the curriculum that doesn't include the high school, that doesn't include a lot of other things. And so it gives us a sense though of just the base curriculum, what the total is for that, um, for it to be allocated. So that's another sort of a cross check against what are we, as we're thinking about what budgets should be um, and working towards some of these numbers, like how do we make sure that everyone has in their budgets what they should have in like, if Gabe's materials budget is starved, well, it should probably be set at whatever the multiplication is for K-8 social studies for each year. We can, we can break that out for each one of those programs. Um, so do we wanna go back to your presentation, Mary Ellen, or, or are there any other questions from people before we do that? Are there any in the chat? I don't see any in the chat. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to other. Um, I'm not sure we finished with supplies. I think we're still in supplies a little bit. Let's make sure. Uh, Breakdown. This is, oh, so I have a question. So for some of these other accounts that are here, like copy machine supplies, if we have copier rentals and leases, these lease programs in the services, are we not, are our leases not all in? We're required to provide our own supplies or what's going on with that? Uh, yes, we are required to provide some of our supplies, um, staples and staplers and toners. And uh, Dave Genicakis does that as a, large um, town-wide group purchasing. Okay. And then what are the uniforms and protective clothing? Is that just like the blue shirts or what is that? That's the, um, those are um, contract related for, uh, I believe the custodians have a um, uniform allowance as part of their contract. Um, so that's where that sits. I see. Is it provided to them as a stipend or is it provided to them on, on a reimbursement basis or how does that work? Um, I believe they have the option. Uh, either or? Either or. You mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other questions that people have in supplies here? And this again is every, every account that's over $10,000, right? Is what you yeah. should? Yeah, okay. and there wasn't much left after that. Okay. All right. Um, and again, you can find out whatever vendors that we have. Um, so with other, you know, these are generally where our conference and travel and dues and memberships uh, sit. And that's uh, a, por a significant portion of most departments, uh, professional development budgets and accounts. Um, it, um, so I'm just defining sort of what those all are in each of those slides. Um, where So this is the other part is this is where the special education reserve sits. It's also where the financial assistance reserve sits um, as well. Um, and um, so we um, have a budget of roughly $192,000 for outside conference uh, education and training and conferences. Uh, we have a budget of approximately $147,000 for professional dues and memberships uh, for across the district. Um, I just bolded the LTD insurance line. That is a line that relates to employees that are not covered by the workers' comp law. And there's a uh, payroll 
uh, reduction and add back for that in the payroll. Our, our this account gets charged for that, and then we every year we pay for athletic insurance, um, which is not covered uh, by our general liability insurance that is charged to us. So that's what this category is and includes. Um, so uh, the primary two for PD sit here um, of a 192 and 147. Um, and I just, um, so this is the history here of this budget, um, of this category, I should say. And um, we've uh, level funded it again for next year. And then I just, um, we were adding just, we do did an adjustment to the LTD back in 2018. It's um, and been adding it roughly about two and a half percent to it. I level funded it this year um, due to staff turnover uh, for next year that um, the 45,000 should be ample uh, for covering that staff, covering that amount. So that's other, any other question, any questions about our other category? Helen. What is the total budget for this year for other? Is it the same? It's the same. It's, we're just, okay. It's level funded, it's the same. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Yep. Can you go back to the, um, I have a question about the professional dues and the memberships, so then also the education training and conferences. How do you, how do you determine what the right number is for those accounts? Like, for example, so education training and conferences, you said is PD, right? Yes. So how do we know, like, do we allocate, I'm making this up, but like $300 for a conference every, how do you know what the right number is here? Um, person, I don't, I depend on the 60 plus budget managers to really kind of inform what that is. And um, historically, that's been an amount that they have basically drawn from to attend, you know, send teachers to conferences and the like. Um, and sometimes they will transfer funds from their supply budgets or other budget line items to pay for conferences for teachers to attend. Um, is the same with professional dues and memberships as well. Gabe? Yeah, I think this is one that at least from my experience, both in social studies and then in central office, um, is actually highly variable budget to budget, even if district wide, we might be pretty similar. Um, so like for social studies, if the national conference for social studies or the national conference is local, we might decide to send a bunch of teachers because we don't have to pay all the transportation costs, but I probably wouldn't be able to afford sending them literally anywhere else in a, in another year. So I wouldn't budget for the national conference. And so that, since those kind of rotate through and Boston is a bit of a hub, we do get a few of those as they rotate. Um, the other education training stuff could like, so for EDCO, for example, our membership to EDCO is actually paid out of the consulting line, which is the 5-2, but every individual class we send a teacher to comes out of this 5-5 line. So like that big bucket for EDCO is actually in multiple budget places. Um, so that might vary as teachers participate differently in when I was in central office, we would just kind of estimate it based on history because um, we wanted to be able to provide opportunities for teachers as much as possible. Um, this is one that is speaking personally for social studies, right? Like I've done the least spending in this during the pandemic, but that means there's sort of a backlog of training and professional learning work to do because the need for the professional learning didn't go away for the last two years. Um, so I might actually plan to spend more of, on a higher percentage of my own budget on this in the future. So do we like, for example, are the dollar amount isn't changing year to year on that one though. So, but your, your message, as I understand it, Gabe is, for example, like, I don't know what you call the national social study, the NSSA, or I don't know what you call the social studies association, yeah. NSSTA, whatever it is. Um, like, you, they know their conference travel. They know what's going on for, it's like it's been booked for years out. So do we forecast and do people actually put in budgets that match their plan? Thank you, Dimitri, NCSS. <laughs> um, do people actually put in their budgets for the, for the places that they're planning on going? 
often. Like how does this get allocated in a way that maps think, to intent? Yeah, I think practically speaking, yes. But our, again, speaking for like the curriculum department, our budgets have been cut for the last few years. Um, and so this is where often we end up turning to sources like the BEF or other folks to fund this sort of thing. Um, but also again, that, that five, five, like that specific line encompasses a lot of different individual activities. Um, so again, like the EDCO courses are coming out of the, the budget, but maybe like speaking for FY21 for social studies, I actually basically zeroed out this part of my budget. I think I spent $400 um, on the virtual conference because it was really cheap. Um, and I didn't, you know, so, but again, in a future, like, it's somewhat hard to say also because it's then based on teacher interest and teacher participation. Um, so I might say I want to send a dozen teachers to the NCSS conference. And then we find out there's more interest. So I might move money from another line into it um, because I want to support folks interest um, or I may end up having a reserve. Right. Helen. So one of the things that I've seen, you know, in other fields, but also in education is most of the, the conferences for the foreseeable future are going to be online, uh, virtual, uh, they're not going there. And I'm wondering if this is an area, I don't, I don't want to take it away at all, you know, because I think, it, I, I think it's something we, we need to aspire to and hope that it's going to happen again. I think the interaction with people being together is great. Uh, but things like this, like MSAN that we haven't done in the last uh, last year because of uh, COVID, all those things, um, I'm not sure are going to happen this coming year. So we may want to think about, you know, having a placeholder for them somewhere in, in 23. But for 22, I'm not sure that it makes sense to budget for them. Also, budgeting for EDCO, that's not going to be also doesn't make sense. Though there'll be other expenses from Medco, but that's separate. Um, Mary Ellen, I'm not remembering this off the top of my head, but does our tuition assistance, which is contractually obligated, does that come out of this uh, 551099 line? I think it does. Mike is, Mike is nodding, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's about thirty two or $35,000 yep. that is contractually obligated. Well, and to, to, to your point and to Helen's point, there's a lot of virtual conferences happening right now. So there might be the opportunity to do these things, but it doesn't necessarily need to be this whole dollar amount that we're holding, um, given the lack of actual travel plus the lack of, because the conferences are cheaper because they're all being held virtually. Um, and as you said, EDCO, but there's also this contractual bit. Um, can you talk a little bit too about the professional dues and membership? Like how um, does, again, my same question, how is that like decided who gets, who gets this? What does it mean? Blah, blah. So, uh, for example, one of the memberships that we pay for every year is Matt's all, which is for world language teachers. Um, and, um, that has, uh, some are some, and, uh, MASS, MASC. Um, so these are so district wide memberships yeah. as opposed to any individual professional dues that people are signing up for. Um, generally, although, you know, you have singletons, so it is an individual dues as a singleton because you have those, but. But it's um, a district dues, even dues, if you're paying for an individual. Uh, depends okay. on the organization, but generally, yes. Gabe is flashing his hand, yeah, so keep to. adding in. Yeah, I think. Um, Often, I think administrators dues have been in included in this. So um, like historically in the social studies budget, the curriculum coordinators dues for NCSS were charged to that budget. Um, but also in some other content areas, and then the only one I know of off the top of my head is performing arts. Um, there's a kind of a higher need. And so like in order for our students to participate in district solo ensemble, the teacher needs to be a dues paying member to the association. Otherwise our students can't participate. It's sort of like locked into the system, almost like the NCAA. Um, and so I believe, and I'm speaking for Kenny a little bit here, but I think I'm right, um, is that Kenny says, 
because our he doesn't want to hurt our students based on an individual teacher's decision he covers the cost out of the performing arts budget particularly important at the high school level so that individual teachers don't have to pony up for that in order for students to participate um that's variably true in different content areas for different things i know athletics has a whole thing related to it so who decides what gets covered the administrator that um has the account and what their priorities are so how did we decide what their dollar amount was to begin with it's historic it's it's carried over historically we so if there if you ask if there was a decision made to update i mean that's made by the administrator that runs the department i mean again i can only speak for social studies which is the budget i i cover but for this year when i looked at my total amount um that nicole gave me in the or nicole gittens gave me in the summer i was like i can't cover everything i want to cover that i have historically covered so i personally made choices to pull out of that right and i covered my own membership um in a less lean year i might have covered it because it has because it has historically been part of the budget okay any questions on, on other from anybody else? I mean, I definitely have a question of if we're changing, if this is a, a staffing thing too, it sounds like there's, it has to do with the number of staff we have too, as opposed to just historical. For example, we're talking about adding a whole bunch of social workers next year, but is Maria's budget for this going up? Probably not. And I don't know if it should. Mm -hmm. So like, and we're also talking about like adjusting other things and should those things go down? It just seems like there should be some more, it sounds small, but all of these things add up, right? Like, and, and how we make sure that people are being treated equitably. If one area had a whole bunch of people and their dues were set in 1980, and then some other areas tripled in size since then, like, why do they still get the same amount of dues money? Mm -hmm. to cover that. Maybe it's still fair because it's a site license, so to speak, a site, it covers the whole district, but I just am not clear on that. And anyway. But Mariah, I don't think that's the way I understood it. The, the, at least the way I understood it is that the budget managers make that decision. So if there is an adjustment in terms of uh, numbers that is being made, but what I understood Mary Ellen saying by historic would be whatever the base unit they would use whatever is the history to charge for that. I'm not sure that I didn't quite understand that. I thought I understood that there's a historical number here and how they choose to spend their money might come out of the here or somewhere else because they're not allocating their, they, they are, they're working with whatever budget they're given, not that they're proposing necessarily a different number to spend based on their staffing. Is that accurate, Gabe or Mary Ellen? I was going to say, it's sort of both true. Like initially, I propose a number, right? This is not Schrodinger's cat or no, whatever. No, but, <laughs> but initially, right, I might propose a number and say, "Here's what I want. Here's what I need to run my program." And like to use Dimitri's example, like let's say, for example, so the state created this new civics project that we have to do in eighth grade, right? And imagining that there was like a civics districts or a civics day, and all my teachers now had to be members, I would say this thing has changed. I need this much money to cover their their cost, right, of their membership, because they're not all members. And we'd have a conversation, and that would be with the deputy superintendents of admin and finance and OTL, right, and they might come back and say, look, I know you need this, we don't have any more money, you're getting what you got last year, figure it out. And so I would say, well, either I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to pull a little bit from materials, right, I'm going to buy a few fewer books to make sure I cover the teacher's membership costs so that we can do this civics thing. Right, that that's kind of the way it works, and so I would still. Do you out actually the, adjust your budget in, or do you your materials budget, or do you just leave everything the budget the way it was? Um, probably varies realistically. Um, yeah, they technically don't have to pull from the materials line. Um, I probably wouldn't just because it saves a step. And yeah, bottom. no, I hear you. So, I'm just thinking again of how we map what's going on to what we've budgeted. Okay. Um, any more? Oh, Susan, go ahead. Oh, um, I have something as we're, if we're still going through slides, I don't have a question on the slide, but if we're just starting to wrap up, I have a question. So where are we? 
we have one more category and then okay, we're done. Ahead. Then I'll, Helen? I'll Yeah, just, oh no, please go back. Sorry. So this may be a, a silly thing, but the 558080, is it the special education reserve from the circuit breaker? It's, yeah, no, 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 not from circuit breaker. No, 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 it's not the reserve from circuit breaker. It is the operating budget reserve of 475. Okay. That's why I have special ed reserve in blue. Right. The title is not the appropriate title. That's what I wanted to ask you because grants and donations given doesn't make sense if it's a Correct. special ed. Thank you okay. for noticing my craptacular chart of accounts. Okay, thank you. So equipment. Hold on there, Mary Hunt. That is no way your chart of accounts. That piece of crap came from the 90s. It was copied incorrectly when they did this system. Just all right, so you all know, enough. it's not her fault. <laughs> the, um, you oh, sorry, there are two categories. Utilities is very simple. It's very fast. It's gasoline. I broke this out, started breaking this out um, because it was lumped in with other. Um, and es essentially, there's one vendor um, that's paid through DPW and, and we have uh, reduced that line item because of the pandemic for 21 and uh, we've level funded it and there is some exposure for, um, so basically athletics and buildings is where um, the gasoline is spent. Um, so I just wanna finish up with equipment. Um, so generally we have equipment lines, they're 5A to 6A. Don't, I don't know why there are alpha characters in it, but um, they are generally sort of replacement of equipment. And for us, um, our vendors that we pay over $10,000 really are around. Um, and I also don't understand why our leases for our computers are in equipment. Um, generally that's a contracted service or a service. In other communities I've been in, but uh, we have leased. So Hewlett Packard, Wells Fargo, Apple, um, are, those are all th leases for our uh, hardware um, replacement and program um, and the others have to do with um, uh, small pieces and parts of hardware um, and um, I do the next slide so we are not proposing any increase in those um, the budgets are still sufficient to handle our lease dollars um, these are essentially the line items that we have um, so the two large ones are definitely uh, related to uh, leased and what you'll notice, what we will notice over time is that this account for leased equipment will become larger and then this one is supposed to be for pure kind of buyouts of equipment. Um, the $1,000 and the $18,000 are generally sitting in the curriculum coordinators line items. Um, I'm going to pick on art. So typically this is where um, Alicia would be buying um, or replacing equipment or maintaining the kilns um, with related to the art, um, art department. Um, and so that's, this is our last slide, which is what our total of our expense budget is. Um, so I just want to sort of go back and see if there are any questions around our equipment budgets or computers and technology. I have a question, but I'll, I'll see if anyone else has a question before me. Seeing none. Um, my question is, do we have a like a capital plan? Like, how do we know what the right amount is for computing equipment? And what is this, like, you know, at what point, so what is the, the plan um, here? <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, the plan needs to be updated. Uh, the last plan was part of the 2015 override and we are coming to the end of that plan. Um, of which this 2020 and 21 really sort of ended the um, purchase and buyout of those of that plan. So uh, we have moved to Chromebooks, which um, helped accelerate the plan significantly due to the cost factor. Um, but we are now in a place where we need to actually uh, begin replacing our overhead projector systems. Um, in schools that were purchased um, as part of, Runkle is a prime example, uh, where those systems were put in as part of the building project. And so they were ending, we're approaching use, the end of use of life on some of those pieces of equipment. So we need to, that's, so we do, the district does need to sit down and have a, um, a plan developed um, or renewal of a plan developed with where we are, certainly remote learning 
um, and owls and other um, different teaching tools um, and setups have, have emerged. And um, so that's a, a probably would be uh, one of the items of the to-do list I would have with the new superintendent um, and senior staff with OTL. Deputy superintendent needs to be involved in that. Um, Casey No Miller is the deputy superintendent for student services, highly needs to be involved with sort of what that long-term planning and the next plan is and what that next plan needs to look like and what does our equipment distribution need to look like? What does our professional development need to look like to support teachers um, using technology? So I'm not totally sure I got the answer. Like. We're, it, 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 we're, are we in a payment plan and this is the last payment of a plan or, no. so we, how do we, we know that these dollar amounts are what we need, especially given the amount of investment that happened over the past year? Um, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong, but I got the impression that we did a whole bunch of stuff this year um, in terms of transformation of classroom technologies. Um, and um, mo none of that that was all purchased outright um and you're saying you said none of that was or all of that was all of it was right so like what are we actually what we're budgeting for because fy22 is level funded from fy21 right so what is this actually like what is the what are the purchases contemplated here um it's really maintaining and sustaining what we have um not necessarily an expansion not necessarily a change we need, we're at a point, and I guess I was trying to address, like the need is we need a, uh, you, you need a leadership team pulled together to actually devise and discuss the next plan. That normally would have happened in this fiscal year of 21, that would have happened if we did not have a pandemic. Um, that didn't happen, so it's been delayed a year, so that plan does need to be developed going, going forward, because we're, we're at an end of a plan, so we're just in maintenance mode. So how much does maintenance that? mode cost? What you have in your budget at this point. But how do we know what's this amount? Sorry to ask. I feel like I'm asking the so same question over and over. You need to ask somebody over, else so. that specific okay. question because I can't cover the- Should I ask, should, is it a question for Scott? Is in my head and all of that. So it's is not it a Scott, question? It's, like, it's not Scott question. It's if you're talking about hardware, it's, um, it's our, it's Fung, Fung Yang. Okay. Um, and Scott has some, you know, ideas and, you know, is part of the future planning and needs to be part of future planning around where, where dollars go in the future with changes we've made in classrooms and the like. But if you're just asking stand in place, this is what we're continuing, Fun can answer that question. If you want to ask the question, what do we need going forward, that there needs to be lots of conversation around what that is with a lot of different players. Yeah. And that has not happened and nobody can answer that question. And I guess I'm more asking, because we're talking about the FY22 budget, and to your point, we're sort of in this transition year and that sort of is capping off, it's a transition year capping off a, a technology investment plan that started in 2015. So, you know, what do we actually need to spend here? And so you're saying Feng would be, Feng would be the right person to talk to about that. Just stand in place, yes. Okay. So Helen. Mariah, one of the things that people at the school committee who haven't been around for a while don't, don't know is that every time we bring a new building online, there's a significant capital investment in uh, technology of all sorts, not just computers. Um, and that's happened with every new building. But isn't that funded through the override and not through oh, yeah, the operating yeah. no, budget? No, absolutely. I, but okay. then you don't need to fund some of that. You have you know, some breathing room when that happens is what I'm trying to say. Right, but what catches you is where we are with Runkle, where the overhead projection systems need to be updated and replaced. And that's part, that's the long-term part of the planning and the next yeah, planning. It is doesn't last got, forever. Yeah, is yeah, absolutely. Buildings? And I guess that's my that question, right? Is like, does this represent maintenance or does this represent something else? And maintenance of what? Is it like, I'm making it up, but we own is it like 6,000 Chromebooks and we have to replace 600 of them every year because yeah. they just stop, yeah, you know, whatever it is, that's what I'm kind of trying to get to. And it sounds like Fang's the right person yeah. to talk to. And if it's 300 Chromebooks and it's 20 projectors and it's, you know, just whatever that is to understand 
what this is a $1.2 million investment. So what is it, right? Okay. Um, and that's okay. the end of um, our walk through our expense lines. Um, I know Susan had a question and we also have a public comment. Um, Susan, would you be willing? Sharing? Yeah, Susan, would you Is be willing okay? to hold, hold? Yes, that's fine to hold on one minute. We'll let public comment happen and then we'll um, go ahead to your question and to other comments. Um, Robin, are you still here? You are. Would you be yes, able to, thank you, to turn on public comment? Is this Kyle? Yes, hi, how are you? Hi, Good evening. go ahead. Um, my name is Kyle Tompkins and I'm speaking on behalf of the Enrichment and Challenge Support Specialists in our district. Um, thank you for letting our voices be heard tonight. While we know this might not be the exact right revenue uh, venue, this is a time sensitive issue and we've tried to reach out using other channels um, without much success. Um, many of you may remember the current ECS program as the former gifted and talented program. However, after a program review in 2015, a newly developed model broadened our reach to work collaboratively with teachers, students, and the community alike. Over the past few years, we've developed project-based learning units for our students to immerse themselves into the curriculum, designed a maker mindset, created maker spaces or maker space carts, and introduce design thinking with a focus on empathy. As you know, there's a proposal that the ECS program be suspended next year. Tonight, I am not here to plead for my position, our positions, but rather to speak on behalf of those students who will certainly be impacted. Those who thrive in a making environment with uh, think with their hands and excel with the challenges that give them opportunities to think critically and creatively. Many of you were at the school committee meeting on March 4th. My colleagues and I listened in shock and dismay as Superintendent Marini described the ECS program as, and I quote, not functioning, floundering, non-productive, and that we need to quote, take a bit break to be reimagined. I know that I left the Zoom confused and angry to be treated with such disrespect. Tonight, my colleagues and I are compelled to set the record straight and add context to those comments. We have reached out to Superintendent Marini, but we have not heard back yet. While we do believe the comments were not meant to be intentionally hurtful or insensitive, they were. And we couldn't help but wonder where these ideas were formed because they don't reflect our daily reality over the last few years. Not one senior level administrator, or in fact, any administrator at all has reached out to us to discuss any concerns. So you can imagine how unsettled and surprised we all were on that night. Budgetary concerns, equity issues, and our quote, non-productive department were reasons for the suspension of ECS, and I'd like to just address them briefly. First, to give just some perspective, the ECS budget makes up but a tiny fraction of, of the overall budget. The current budget figures is less than 0 0.004 of the overall budget. That's 0 0.004. That says something right there. Secondly, equity. Equity across the eight schools was another reason given for the suspension. And I am confident that we all can agree that equity is certainly an issue. But the question is, is can we agree on the root cause? Here are a couple facts to consider. First- Kyle, can I ask you to be a little faster too? Um, I think you're past two minutes already. Yeah. Um, um, Thank you. Thought also um, requested to speak and we were told that I could, she could yield her time to me. Okay, I thought it was the other way around. She was yielding to you. So if you're no. gonna speak for both of you, that's fine. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, okay. thanks. In December, 2019, an ECS specialist needed to leave mid-year from Pearson, Pearson Heath. While we were told the position would be filled by leadership, no one was hired. 
Last year, our coordinator was reassigned to another position and the district failed to hire a replacement. And during last year's fiscal chaos, an ECS specialist who is a person of color was rift. Our budget at the beginning of this year was frozen. And finally this year, three skillful ECS specialists stepped up and took other positions that were in need, two classroom teachers and a math coach. This is what is known as a death by a thousand cuts. To use equity as the reason to suspend ECS is upsetting. Is it a problem that all schools and students aren't being supported by an ECS specialist? Yes, but it's a problem that has been created by district leaders. Individuals from our program have been cut, reassigned, or not rehired when they left. That is what caused the problem in the first place. Another reason that and that was given for the program that we need to take a break to be reimagined, even though a detailed program review occurred in 2015, a process that brought teachers, specialists, principals, district wide coordinators, and parents in the community together to make recommendations based on best practices, current research, and established district wide goals. Under the leadership of Matt Rosenthal, ECS has developed a thoughtful and long term vision focusing on the implement, implementation of design thinking and project-based learning, as well as utilizing maker spaces for hands-on problem solving, all supported at some point by the school committee with the creation of a state-of-the-art maker space at Ridley and one in the plans to be added to the new Driscoll School. We are confused why suspending a program would be an effective strategy when the vision was decided in a program review very recently and at the risk of losing the expertise of those that have served in the role for years. It just doesn't make sense. We pivot for a moment to address the comment that ECS has been non- Kyle, can I ask you to conclude? Cause we're like about six minutes now. Okay. Past your time and me's time. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think the main point in this piece is that this fifth grade student from Ridley sums up the ECS program. The challenges helped me think about things in a way that I never thought about before. And the school committee is at the crossroads. You have a major decision to make, whether you are going to support the ECS program and the values that it encompasses, rigor, challenge for all students, design thinking, innovation, project-based learning, or you're not. Um, and I think this decision will speak volumes to both the parents and the students that create, crave these hands-on engaging activities. So we strongly encourage you to support the Enrichment Challenge Support Program and reject the proposal to suspend it next year. Um, so we would appreciate your consideration of that. And if you have any questions, any of my colleagues or myself would be happy to discuss on a Zoom um, or whatever uh, media medium works for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. No problem. Um, okay. Susan, returning to you. So first of all, thank you, Kyle, for that. Thank you, Mies. I think there's sort of a lot to unpack with what you just said, but I'm also mindful that tonight is about non um, personnel costs. So I have a lot of thoughts on what you just said, but I just want to um, try to figure out where we landed on the on the first piece. I'm not, I just, I don't wanna discount it, but just to figure out where we landed on the first piece, I guess it seems to me that there are kind of two things that are going on here. And one is the fact that we don't really seem to have, um, it was hard, it was hard about this is that we're not being able, we're not, we're not able to make sort of managerial accounting decisions because a lot of this is getting presented to us in financial accounting terms. And we've talked about this for many years, but I think now is sort of a, it's sort of a coming to a head a little bit because we're not able to sort of look across and say, how much money are we spending on elementary math? How much money are we spending on elementary science? How much are we spending on elementary social studies? Because it, because the PD aspect, the external services, the other kinds of, you know, expenses, the salary lines, like all these things are in slightly different curriculum. They're all in different places. And so I think I would just admire and applaud the curriculum coordinator work and what you've been trying to pull together. I think 
it's just it's it's challenging for me to try to figure that out because some of these things technology is sort of spread across a lot of different areas so i guess one of the things that i'm trying to sort out especially in a tight budget year is and they're all tight budget years but is, is sort of how do we square that circle because we've sort of been talking about it for a while and i'm and it feels to me like until we unwrap that it it's we're still going to be in this place where where we're not able to kind of make these kinds of decisions because we don't have the full picture. So I guess I'm trying to sort of sort out that piece. Um, and, and I think each one of these has a lot of history behind it. So the technology piece, how much is outsourced, how much is on the town side, how much is on the school side, there have been many bites at that apple and many, you know, rounds on the on the merry-go-round. Um, and then I think the second piece is that as you look at, you know, even things like custodial, we've been around that, how much do we outsource, how much do we keep in house, we've done it on food services, so every single one of these has a backstory with kind of history to it. And I guess what I'm just trying to get to is it's now sort of March 11th, what is it that we're going to be able to sort of look at in what time frame to be able to find those places where we actually can sort of maybe make it a year without it or or whatever and 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 that's different from you know eliminating entirely forever so i guess it's more of a process observation but it just without that we're not going to be able to make reasonable decisions about here's all the money we're spending on elementary social studies and here is how we're how we're what we're trying to do with that money in any given you know two three year time frame so so I, I'm gonna, I wanna comment on that. I wanna make, I don't know if everyone knows what financial accounting versus managerial accounting is. So it oh, might sorry, be worth, sorry. maybe no, worth no, the no, definition okay. for people who sorry. don't know, cause right, that might be a helpful yeah, description. Sorry, so, finan sorry. so financial, they're, they're both important. It's not an either or, but, but you kind of need both. A financial accounting is things like a cash flow analysis. It's, you know, governed by, you know, you know uh, rules of, um, especially in municipalities of the kinds of categories you need. And they're often yeah. like totally opaque. Whereas and what people like, think about is accounting. That's like financial accounting right. is what people think of when they think of accounting, right? Right. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. So then uh, when you think about managerial accounting, it's much more focused on actual information that gives decision makers the pull together sort of financial picture that they need to be able to make strategic decisions. So the example I gave about elementary social studies and seeing all those different pieces and all those across all those different financial accounting line items in one place is is the challenge and without that we're going to say well we have these goals but we don't actually know how much money we're spending on against those goals so that, yeah. that's it so so i'm glad it's good to make sure that everyone knows what we're talking about when we talk about those things so um so i heard in terms of a process i took some notes of things that i think there are points to, to your point susan there are things that are sort of like as you say, they've been looked at over time. It's good to talk about them again, but there's not, they're not gonna get meaningfully changed or solved. Like um, if there's anything to change or solve, right? Like on some of these things, but there's other areas I think that some of our conversation pointed to of things that we might want to explore a little further. Um, just to give an example, um, you know, David talked about the compensatory services. We talked about some of these other, you know, areas, um, the question of the virtual conferences, EDCO going off, is there some room in that space? You know, we've got some spots where we've like maybe poked and found a little bit of some opportunity to explore further. Um, and I think that those are some of the things though that we can continue to talk about and, and really explore. And then the other thing is that when, when Gabe and the K-8 curriculum coordinators did their, um, what I'm calling supplies, as I understand it, Gabe, for the most part, they essentially were all in on not just supplies, but some of these other things sort of, they were taking a sort of more holistic non-personnel approach to that. Yes. Um, and so, and so to your point, Susan, like we need, that helps us sort of think about those buckets of money from a managerial perspective, as opposed to just the financial perspective. So it doesn't matter if they were funding it from the professional development account or the this account or the that account. It matters to Mary Ellen, but from our decision-making process, it doesn't necessarily matter. Go ahead, Gabe, and then Mary Ellen. I think the one clarification is for the chart that we showed you that you kind of briefly showed, it was essentially like bare bones to run the program we have. Right. We did not include professional learning for program improvement, 
but like in in the health class if we have a new teacher we need to train them in sex ed before they teach sex ed um so that's like a required training that's in but the professional learning in social studies about adapting to the new framework that was not included because technically right. we can run our current program without doing that Right, and that's something that, again, it gives us opportunity to Susan's point to make some of these, like your chart was really helpful because it talked about some of these excluded things and then it lets us have this, again, managerial perspective of, well, how do we wanna talk about PD because it excluded it, right? And then where do we talk about um, um, that? Mary Ellen, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I want to um, provide, or at least I can show you sort of where we already show some of that information from last year through OpenGov. Um, and kind of how we have that set up and, and we are responding to some feedback around how we had last year set up and how that was helpful or not helpful. So if I could take liberty to do that, I think it- That would be great. Um, you and I wanna be this. respectful of people's time too, cause we're close to seven and we said we'd end at seven. So I wanna, hopefully we can end within a couple minutes of seven. Um, so this is the budget development archive. If you go to our budget central, you'll land on 22. So I went into our 21 and this link here, um, our interactive financial plan. Um, and I'm just gonna now have to do this. I had my tabs open to make this faster. Um, the table of contents, which we are changing because we got feedback that this is um, not helpful, but it is our full um, shows where all of our curriculum coordinators are. And since Gabe's uh, here, I'm going to pick on social studies um, specifically. So this shares some of the the narrative around the the budget or what the history has been, what the breakdown is, their goals. Um, and then in OpenGov, this is where our, for 21, our budgets were. Um, and also historically, we've had department heads give objectives um, for 20 and 21. So just in terms of services, for example, that we were talking about earlier with Gabe, you can click on this um, and it brings you into a data table for you to then get into and see the multi-year um, views and the breakdown um, where you have um, personnel, services, supplies, materials, and for services, you can see, you know, where social studies um, has been budgeted and kind of where, see, he, as he talked earlier, he's gone to more online subscription tools for this year um, and spent less in supplies and materials um, because that's what this year um, demanded. When we do 22, we're going to actually have actuals for 20 um, and 21 showing as well. So we're actually expanding the columns for 22 also based on, on some feedback. Um, so you can drill down into each of these um, as well. And so with conferences, here has been his conference. I didn't put mileage in on the other um, because frankly, that has been a little bit of paralysis by analysis of the types of travel we have. So um, that's where um, he had $350 right to date on conferences for this year. So that information is available. I think um, we have not necessarily done a, a good job in, with an orientation to committee members around how to use this tool. And, and unfortunately for 22, we don't have it up and running. So I think to, to Susan's point, point, it makes it very challenging to have the conversations um, that she's looking to have and be able to have. and. So I'm just gonna, and so 22 is going to um, be similar to this um, and be able to have those, that information av available. Um, and then also be able to, as decisions are being made, be updated um, for budget requests, be updated so that, for example, um, our goal for in advance of town meeting is that there'll be position lists that are funded with FTEs on this. So everybody knows what positions are funded by school and by department. Um, not names will not be on there, but the position title and the FTE and and it to the point of um, Susan and being able to make those cross sections of data um, and information that are helpful for decision makers. Yeah, just to reiterate and so thank you for that Mary Ellen. Um, and thank you for Mariah. So having been finance chair last year when you were developing that I, I do remember it, but I think what I was trying to say is that for this set of conversations is really hard to have this conversation without that information. And so that's what I'm trying to solve for. Sure. 
and hopefully we're going to have those open gov do we have an updated eta yet ish no we have um we have a filter problem that is doubling one of the accounts to three actually three separate accounts that we're having to open gov to fix we have a meeting tomorrow to see if we can finally get that fixed um that was one of the accounts uh, pointed out by a member of the public asking about a particular line item and why was it like a million two and it wasn't a million two it's only 688,000 so have, needing to make sure that that's accurate because we don't want to be having to report out on false you know or inaccurate information it just is not helpful to the our budget process so um okay. hopefully i'll have an update for the committee uh, for you mariah and jim um, tomorrow on where that's going okay any last comments questions before we break for tonight susan I yeah, I would just say thank you to everybody who, thank you to all the curriculum coordinators who've done so much work trying to pull this together. Um, and thank you to Mary Ellen for trying to, you know, kind of land this. Um, I guess by, I just, it is worth sort of pausing and trying to think about what information we'll have by when to be able to make what kinds of decisions, because I think we're all aware the clock is ticking and we're all aware that there are like tons of issues. And I think putting those into one frame that gets us to a budget um, that we can sort of have this conversation about in a managerial accounting way, um, especially if programs are being impacted, you know, positions are being eliminated and that sort of thing. It's just hard to hard to be there. So I think that'd be my, my last question. Maybe it's more of a question for Suzanne and David of just, you know, how are we gonna sort of sequence this with, with our school committee meetings um, and those the decisions? Yeah, and, and Jim and Mary Ellen and I have been talking about that too. And so it'd be good for to close that loop. What is what does it look like over the next two months, two plus months? Any other last questions? Um, I just want to say thank you again to the staff who are here, Mary Ellen, Gabe, Matt, um, Casey is gone already, Donna. Um, very grateful for you taking the time and, and walking through this and talking through these details. So everyone enjoy your nights. And uh, see you later. Thanks again. Bye-bye.